Welcome to the Indoor Garden. I'm Liz Kean, and the last time we met, we went on a tour of the beautiful and lush U.S. Botanic Garden in Washington, D.C. With me today are some of the wonderful plant varieties that live there. So now let's take a look at how to keep them alive and thriving in your home. The name Anthurium comes from the Greek word anthos, meaning flower, and aura, which means tail. And as you can see on the flower of this Anthurium, that its stamen does look very much like a tail. This is Anthurium Lady Jane. And there are several different varieties of Anthurium that are available to you. And they're very hardy plants. I really recommend them for a beginner. You can also find them with red flowers and white flowers. And their care is pretty simple. Basically what you need to do is give them some good, bright, indirect light. A lot of direct sun is a bit too much for them, although morning sun would make them especially happy. Or you can place them right in front of a north window that gets no sun at all. And as far as the watering goes on them, a plant like this, which is in a six inch a uh, container here could take about a quart of water when it's dry about a half inch down below the soil surface. They do like to stay a little bit on the moist side. And another hint, during the winter you may want to let them dry out just a little bit more and they'll probably bloom a little more profusely in the springtime. Another thing that'll make your plant really happy is to dust its leaves. Now many of your plants really do appreciate this kind of care, especially if they have big leaves. And the Lady Jane is no exception here. So give your plants a treat and dust them once in a while. Anthuriums do appreciate some humidity. And there are a couple ways that you can provide that for them. One way is to set up a pebble tray, and I'll show you what I mean right here. I took a saucer like this and put in some pebbles about an inch to two inches deep. And then you want to fill up the tray with water just enough so that the plant won't be sitting in water. Just right like that. And then set your plant on top of the pebble tray and as the water evaporates it'll provide humidity for it. Another way that you can provide humidity for the plant is to mist it. You can do this about once a day or so and there are a lot of plants that you have in your home that I'm sure would appreciate this too. Just go ahead and give it a little spray just about once a day. Also, if you have plants in groupings in your home, in other words, several of them sitting together with each other, that will also raise up the humidity. At any rate, your anthurium should be a lovely house plant for you for years and not give you much trouble at all. There are over 10,000 species of fern in the world, and we're going to take a look at a few of them now. The first one I wanted to show you is the bird nest fern with its great big lush leaves. It doesn't look like your typical picture of a fern, but it is indeed. And one way to identify a fern is by their crown, which is the place that fronds grow out of, and their fiddleheads. And this bird nest fern certainly qualifies. As you can see right there in the very center, that's its crown. And just starting to unfurl are its new fronds, or in other words, fiddleheads. This particular bird nest is especially striking. Bird nest ferns are really about the easiest fern to grow. All you have to do is water them when the top feels dry, and then give them a good soak, and put them in some bright indirect light or some morning sun and they'll do just fine for you. And if this particular bird nest fern doesn't quite strike your fancy, I have another one here. It's a hybrid of the bird nest fern and it's called the Japanese bird nest fern and I'll show it to you. 
Here we go. This one too is very lovely. It has a little bit more of a wavy leaf to it. It's a little more compact, but it's certainly quite stunning and just as easy to take care of as the other bird nest fern. So maybe something like this would suit you in your home. These are terrace ferns. Terrace ferns get their name from the Greek word teron, which means wing. And here they are. This one's Terrace critica and Terrace victoria. And this is Terrace albolineata. They're really cute ferns. And you see these quite often in the stores. They're very readily available. And they stay fairly small too. You rarely will see them over about a foot tall. And they shouldn't give you too much trouble. They're one of the easier ferns to keep. Just water them when their top is dry, as soon as the top of the soil feels dry. Give them a good soak. So if you get one in a pot, say this size, you may need to water it two or three times a week. So they do, do need a little bit of extra attention. And the other thing you want to remember with ferns is to give them a good misting. And these guys really love it. I have another small fern here too. You often see it in the stores grouped with the terrace ferns, but it's a little bit different. And this one's called the maidenhair fern. Now this is probably the most difficult fern that you can grow. If you're a, a little bit skeptical about your growing capabilities, don't try maidenhair fern. Now they need to stay very moist. You only want to let the top dry out a little bit and then give them a good soak. And they're very fussy about humidity. A great place to grow one of them would be in a terrarium. But if you want to grow them on a shelf, in your house, for example, then be sure to put them on a pebble tray like we looked at earlier. And always keep the, the uh, pebbles moist so that it can get lots and lots of humidity. But these are really cute ferns I know you would enjoy in your home. And I have just a couple more ferns to show you. I was so inspired when I was at the fern house at the Botanic Garden that I just had to show you several of them today. And this is my very own Boston fern. Now you're probably familiar with this one. It's a very popular variety and it's lived in people's homes since Victorian times. It's also one of the easiest ferns to grow. Just water it when the top feels dry and give it some nice bright light. And it can take some full morning sun without any trouble at all. The one thing about Boston's is you do need to groom them from time to time. I've seen some people with their Boston ferns thinking that they weren't doing very well because they had a lot of dead growth underneath. Well, they tend to do that a lot anyway. You just need to clean them out every once in a while and they'll do just fine. And I also have a hybrid of the Boston with me that's grown really well in my house. And it's over here. It's called Nephrolepis Kimberly Queen. And it's a little bit more like the sword fern. But it's a, really, it's a new variety on the market. It has really thin, narrow fronds on it. But I think it's quite unique. Ferns are so wonderful. They're just graceful, lacy, and plants that are really soothing to have around. So I hope if you've never tried to grow one, that you will. Just remember that you want to keep on misting them. Give them that humidity. Philodendron comes from two Greek words. Philian, meaning to love, and dendron, meaning tree. Now, most of the philodendrons that don't actually climb up trees like to live in trees, and they're called epiphytes. But this particular variety of philodendron is a non-climbing variety. This one's called philodendron pluto, and it's very similar to the one that we saw at the Botanic Gardens. It's actually a brand new hybrid, so you may not have seen it before today but it has really pretty just cut leaves like that and it's a nice full lush plant. It's actually very handsome and would make a wonderful floor plant in your home. It's also very hardy. 
If you buy a plant that says philodendron on it, most likely it's a hardy and easy to grow plant. All you have to do with these is let them dry out quite a bit before you water them. Now this particular one is in a 10 inch pot and you would want to let this one dry out, oh, I would say a good two inches or so before you watered it again. So you really won't need to give it much attention at all. And there is one thing, though, you do want to do for it that would give it a little bit of extra care and attention, and that is to dust it. This one also likes to be dusted. And I know I've mentioned that before today, but it's really, you can't, I can't overdo it on the dusting. They do, it keeps the leaves nice and clean. It makes them breathe easier. They're just a lot happier if you dust them once in a while. So if you go to the store and you're looking for a really hardy plant to grow, look for a philodendron. This one's philodendron Pluto, but there are other varieties too, and any of them should do really well for you. You can find them in floor plant sizes, you can find them as a shelf plant, and you can even find them as a hanging basket. The sturdy yucca is native to North, Central, and South America. And I have two of them here today. As you can see, they have these wonderful, long, deep green, spiky leaves. And in fact, they may even look somewhat familiar to you because there are some varieties of yucca that live outside in this area and are very winter hardy. But these particular yuccas are not that way. So if you get one of these, you definitely want to keep them in the house. And sometimes when you go shopping for a yucca, you'll find them like this, as a single stalk in a pot. And this one here is an eight inch pot. It's sitting all by itself, just one nice big stalk. And sometimes you'll see yuccas like this. They're actually growing on different sized canes. And they've got different heads sprouting out all over the place. Now, how is that possible? Well, the growers take different sections of just a plain piece of cane that's still alive. They stick them into pots of potting soil and their heads sprout out. It's really that easy. It takes a little while for them to actually develop into a plant this size, but that's basically what happens. And these are really tough plants. They'll live in your house for a long time. You can give them full sun if you like, or they're even tolerant of less than full sun. I have an assistant who grows his in front of a north window. He's had it for a few years, and it does great. It's doing really well. They don't require too much attention as far as watering goes. They like to get quite dry before you water them. A plant like this, which is an eight inch pot, you should let dry a good two to three inches down. And then it can be watered with about a quart and a half of water. It's fine to give it a thorough soak, but do let it dry out. And the same with this plant. It's in a 10 inch pot, so you probably want to let it get dry as far down as you can feel, actually, and it can take up to two quarts of water. And I also recommend fertilizing regularly. Good regular fertilizing really helps keep a plant healthy. Even though they may be quite sturdy and durable, good fertilizing makes a difference. So don't forget to do that for your yucca and for all your plants. These plants are known as the rubber tree, or ficus elastica. And I believe that comes from the fact that its white sap can be made into rubber. Now you've probably seen this plant before too. It is quite a favorite house plant for many, many years. I know my mother has one that she's had for years, maybe the only plant she's had for years, and it's very tolerant. In the summer, she puts it outside in the shade, and in the winter, she keeps it in a corner of her family room. And even though it's in that lower light, it seems to do just fine as long as she puts it outside for the summer. 
My recommendation for light with the rubber plants is to give them some direct sun, although they are quite tolerant of less light. In fact, for a while, I knew many people thought of them as a low-light plant. I personally would not classify them as a low-light plant, although they do tolerate bright indirect light. But if you put them in front of a sunny window, they will be a gorgeous plant. And they do have beautiful leaves. They're just nice, thick, leathery, green leaves, as you can see. And they do tend to grow up more and more and become a tree. Now here you can see there's a new leaf starting to come out. When you go to look for a plant, or just about any plant, it's always good to look for new growth. It's a good sign that that's a plant that you should buy. As far as the watering goes, they like to dry out quite a bit. Unlike other ficuses, this ficus likes to sit on the dry side. Now these two I have in 10 inch pots and I would let them dry out a good couple inches down below the soil line. And when they get that dry, you can give them up to two quarts of water if you've got them in this size. And they really are another plant that should do very well in the house, especially if you give it some good light. I also wanted to mention at this time that many plants are very good at keeping the air clean in your home and in your office. And these rubber trees can grow to be enormous plants. They can be wonderful air cleaners. So don't forget about that when you're deciding on what you need for your home. Plants will definitely help out your environment as well as beautify it. And the other thing, of course, it's got those big leaves. Don't forget to dust. And now we're going to go visit a friend of mine, Wally Reed from the Botanic Garden. Hi, Wally. Hi, Liz. Welcome to my workshop. Well, this is great. Now, you may remember Wally. He was our tour guide when we went to the U.S. Botanic Garden. And I thought he would be the perfect person to show us how to air layer a rubber plant. So what is air layering, Wally? Air layering is a form of propagation, Liz, when uh, a plant gets a little bit out of shape, especially a Dracaena, uh, a Diefenbachia, or a certain ficus species, you can air layer it, not just prune the, the part of the plant and throw it away, but actually make a cutting that still is attached to the mother plant. Oh, that's great. So if your rubber tree looks like it's getting out of control, you don't have to just chop it up and throw it away. No. You can actually make cuttings from it. That's exactly right. Oh, great. Well, let's see how. Okay. The first step uh, is actually to choose a nice, soft, green, leafy tip, just like you would make any other cutting. Uh, the first step is to remove leaves from the area that you want to make the cutting from. Uh, and you can just slice those off. The next step is to take a knife, and I don't like to use a real sharp knife on this particular thing because sometimes you can put too much pressure on it and slice right through the stem. So I like to use a dull knife. And you take your knife uh, at about a 45 degree angle, cut into the stem, and this is where the dull knife comes into play. You just slowly work it back and forth. Uh, you want to cut about halfway through. And I like to work on the back side of the stem because it uh, holds up just a little bit better. Okay, when you get a cut about four inches long, you want to take your knife, and this is where an extra pair of hands comes in. Let's how about hold this stem up a little bit sure. if you can. All right. Uh, uh, the next step you want to do is uh, add a little bit of rooting hormone. If you'd hand me that, please. And you can just put this on with the blade of the knife. Just dip your knife in. and add it right to the open wound. Okay. Oh, okay, and this is available at most garden most centers? Most garden centers or plant stores uh, will have rooting hormone. Uh, the next step is you take a small amount of sphagnum moss, and you take this moss and just wedge it into the open cut. Uh, it's a little bit of a messy procedure. You might want to go ahead and do this outside or in the bathtub somewhere. Now, after you've got the that cut pried open, you want to take a big handful of moss next. Okay. Big handful. And sort of split that handful in half. Wrap half around the top and half around the bottom. 
After you've got that in hand, the next thing to do is take your plastic. It's regular old piece Regular of old plastic, an old cleaner's bag or uh, a piece of saran wrap, anything that'll hold the moisture in. That's basically what we're doing here is holding the moisture in. And you want to wrap this around the cut and the moss at the same time. Well, you can tell we're out here at the noisy outdoor botanic gardens today. <laughs> okay, after you get the plastic, the next thing to do is take a couple of other smaller pieces of twist them. Take one at the bottom, and you don't want to wrap this too tight with the wire. You can sometimes cut off the circulation. So just tight enough to keep that poly in place. Small piece around the top. And you want to leave a little room at the top here, if you can, of your layer uh, to add a little water in case that moss dries out. Uh, now, this will stay on here for about four to six weeks, uh, after which time you'll start to see small white roots form. After the small white root form, then the, then the plant can be removed and potted in a plant, or potted in a pot, just like a, a normal cutting. Uh, on these low ones, sometimes you might have to support them. So what I like to do is take an extra piece of twist them. I think I have one in my pocket here. I've got one. Oh, okay. And for support, wrap it uh, around the top of the, the air layer and attach it back to a part of the stem that you didn't use. That helps take some of the pressure off the cut that you made. That is a good idea. Make it a little easier on the plane. That's right. Sometimes uh, using large plants, especially ficus and dracaenas and uh, diefenbachis, the cuttings are quite heavy and the weight of the cutting will sometimes break off at the air layer. Uh, that's, that's basically what it is. After four to six weeks, you notice good root formation in here. You take a pair of shears, cut it off just below the moss line, put it in a pot, give it water, and in about two weeks, it'll, leaves will perk back up and you have uh, not only a layered plant, but a pruned plant as well. So that really is quite simply done. Very easily. Well, thanks a lot, Wally. Okay, you're welcome, Liz. Nice to see you again. You too. Ficus means fig in Latin, and almost all the ficus plants that can live in the home are able to produce figs at some time or another. If this one had figs, it would look like almost pea-sized little fruits along its stem, and they usually fall off before they get any bigger than that in captivity. Now this particular fig's name is ficus lorata. And it's called that. Lorata actually means fiddle or violin. And their leaves are very much violin or fiddle leaf shaped. That's why it got its name. This is also a good house plant. In fact, I have a friend of mine who has one. And it's a focal point in his living room. He keeps it right in front of a west window, and it is gorgeous. It has great full leaves all the way up and down. And your fiddle leaf fig would do the best also in front of a west or a south window where it got some good direct sun. Although they are tolerant of less light than that, that would really be the best place for them. They're really a magnificent plant. If you choose one for a room in your home, you know it's going to stand out. And when you go to water this plant, check the soil, let it dry out about a couple inches down. This one is in a 14 inch pot, so it can dry out a little bit below the soil line before you water it. And you can give it up to a gallon of water when you do water it. And don't forget to fertilize it, and it'll be a gorgeous plant for many years for you. I have a couple letters from some viewers that I'd like to share with you. The first one is from Rob in Falls Church, Virginia, and he writes, Dear Liz, my brother who lives in New Mexico keeps his large fern in a southern window. It seems that it is getting too much sun. Is the sun too strong for the plant? 
Yes, it is. A south window is entirely too much light for a uh, fern. What it'll do is it'll just bleach it out. And sometimes, even though they're hardy, they'll hang in there and they'll still be alive, but they won't be nearly as pretty as if you put them in a east or a north window. And the second letter says, Dear Liz, every plant I buy seems to die. I have trees obscuring my southwest windows and only a little light coming in on the northeast side of the house. What plants can you recommend that grow in low light and don't need much care? Signed, Plantless in Arlington, Virginia. There are several varieties of plants that love low light and should do just fine for you. The Dracaena is one variety. There are several Dracaenas. Philodendrons, we saw one on the show today. Aglaonemas, or Chinese evergreens. Or Sansevieria. I think if you try one or two of those and discover that plants will live for you, then you can get a few more. But even that low light that you have will allow you to have many plants. Today we've seen some of the lovely plant varieties from the U.S. Botanic Garden and I really want to thank Willow Run for letting us use some of their beautiful specimen plants. And you take care of your plants and we'll see you next time.